Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian covering the 20th anniversary edition of DSCI, one of the world's truly great defense and security shows here at the Excel Center in London on the waterfront, where our coverage is sponsored by L3 Harris and Leonardo DRS, and we're also partnered with Clarion Events, the organizer of this great exhibition that uh, also uh, coordinates a number of different conferences all around the world. We're also working in partnership with the UK Department of International Trades, Defense and Security organization to bring you the very best of British defense uh, and we're over here at the Viasat stand to talk to my friend Ken Peterman uh, the president of government systems uh, uh, one of uh, the truly innovative companies uh, in in space uh, first Ken, bring us up to speed on where Viasat 3 is on each one of the satellites you guys have launched it has been utterly game-changing in the, the staggering amount of bandwidth and the kind of coverage you guys can provide. Viasat 3, obviously multiple satellites providing that coverage. Where are we on the program? Well, of course, Viasat's a remarkable company with a culture of innovation and employee empowerment that unleashes uh, really creative things. Viasat 3 uh, should be in place the first early 2021 with the first one over North and South America. Uh, it'll bring a terabit per second of capacity on game changing. I think right now Viasat has more capacity on orbit than anyone else in the world and with that, first Viasat 3 satellite, I, uh, we, we expect to have more capacity on orbit than everyone else combined. So it's really game changing. And then the next two satellites will give us world coverage, global coverage, and, uh, and those will be about nine months behind the first one. Uh, you know, you, uh, I think we were, we were just talking and in a, a couple of days will be your 40th anniversary uh, in the space and in the satellite business. Uh, I remember you and I talking, it was a long, long time ago where, um, you know, the vision was uh, that that the the kid on 30, I think you told me, like the kid on and, and C38G will have more broadband connectivity than the president of the United States will uh, at the time. Obviously, some of those challenges have been addressed, uh, you know, in, in uh, nearly the two decades ago when we had that conversation. But talk to us about how this game is fundamentally changing. And you guys were real innovators. There was resistance from the Pentagon for quite some time to really go to kind of the technology you guys were providing. But now the game itself is changing with more uh, distributed constellations. Talk to us about your guys' approach and how you're innovating in this new ecosystem that is fundamentally changing. Well, first I think it's important because we have been in this business a long time and it's been a really exciting ride. We saw DOD and the Defense Industrial Base inventing remarkable capabilities, inventing technology to empower warfighters to be able to communicate, to be able to be secure, to be safer than they've ever been before. Mobile networking, GPS, cybersecurity, satellite communications, all of these technologies were invented by, by defense in order to make our warfighters safer and, and be, give them ability to communicate in a really harshest of all possible environments. That technology leadership's crossed over now and is in the private sector and we're seeing smartphones and we're seeing uh, companies like Viasat be a global internet service provider and connect the unconnected with the power of, of low cost, affordable, high capacity satellite communications. So there's a, I would call it a technology dividend, a kind of an untapped opportunity for DOD to move away in these technology sectors, to move away from having to invent technology and really move toward a process of applying and adapting that technology to the warfighter's use case. Now for that to be effective, the defense community needs to in some ways adapt their current acquisition policy practice and perhaps more so even adapt culture to move away from invention into assessment in a quantitative and empirical way, be able to assess and, and empirically measure the performance of these private sector technologies in a warfighter context. Not measure bits per second, but measure lethality, measure safety, measure mission effectiveness, measure the measure these technologies in the currency that the warfighter measures their mission performance in and then, and then assess it that way. Have you uh, seen a change? I mean, obviously every administration wants to do a better job doing this. I mean, I started my career covering acquisition reform. I will end my career covering acquisition reform. This administration's been talking a lot about it. Do you see any of the needles moving? And what's the advice you're giving them to break through some of these log jams? Because despite all the positive effort, it, you know, is the needle moving from the standpoint of a senior member in the industry like you? Well, we're starting to engage in the conversations with senior leadership, and I don't think any of us knows what the answer is, but we do know the status quo is not the answer. And I think that, uh, that as we move forward and we can demonstrate these, in fact, think of it this way. The young men and women that are entering the service today and putting on the uniform, to the way our, the way our uh, senior leaders call it, adorning themselves in the cloth of this nation to serve, okay? They've grown up in a connected world. They've grown up uh, with the power of Siri, and, and their cognitive decision skills, um, their decision-making 
uh, has become somewhat dependent upon uh, being connected to the cloud and having that real-time Siri or, or uh, uh, help in terms of proactive tipping and queuing to let them know what's going on in the world around them and how to take advantage of it and how to be safe, how to navigate in traffic, whatever it might be. When they put on the uniform and go into harm's way and the stakes are so much higher now, they need to have that same kind of capability. They need to be connected in an assured and resilient way. They need to be able to trust the, the communications and the data that, that that's, that's being given to them. And they need to have the same kind of proactive tipping, queuing, same kind of cognitive decision aid available to them when they put their lives on the line in the service of this nation as when they go to the movie theater on Friday night with their buddies, okay? And it's, we don't just have uh, a responsibility to provide them that with it. We have an obligation to provide them with that. And I think that uh, we're beginning to have the dialogue to measure the power of this capability in a warfighter context and then to adapt and change the acquisition process so that we can get this technology to the cutting edge more affordably and more and faster than ever before. Um, what, what do you think is um, the, the edge that you guys bring to it at a time when everybody is looking at microsats and smaller stats and broader constellations? There are a number of different guys who are working to do what it is you guys do. What do you think is the element that distinguishes you and is going to give you guys a, a strategic advantage in an increasingly crowded marketplace? Well, in the defense community, we didn't start out as a satellite provider. We started out as a service provider. So we were buying leasing capacity from other satellite providers in order to stitch together a global capability so that airplanes and, and ships and military customers could constantly be connected with the best available network. It was from that experience that we developed the capability to design our own satellites to fill in the gap based on the use case and the user trajectory that we saw in terms of how they were using the service that we were providing. So we built geo satellites that have had game-changing capacity. Viasat-1, as you recall, was launched in 2011 with 140 gigabits per second of capacity, and state-of-the-art in the market at that time was like six or seven gigabits per second. Viasat-2 had twice that. Viasat-3 will have a terabit per second of capacity, and we will go global with that. So, but we think the answer is, for the military is not to be dependent upon a single network or a single satellite, certainly not being dependent upon a single military satellite that is easily targetable as a military asset. I think we've argued for a kind of a hybrid adaptive network or a Han, and that military customers need to be able to roam seamlessly between their military assets, their satellites and ground ecosystems, but also be able to roam among commercial assets. Geo, because it offers unprecedented speed and capacity, perhaps Mio, because it has attributes that are a little different than that, and Leo from a low latency perspective. So we're looking at the ability to be able to roam freely among a hybrid network, a network or a multi-network or a network of networks, and it builds resiliency and assuredness in terms of keeping the warfighter connected uh, uh, in an unprecedented way. Um, speaking about the warfighter, we're in the United Kingdom. Uh, uh, British government is looking for options post-2023. Uh, Skynet 5 obviously being an important part of their network. Uh, we managed to talk to Richard Franklin over uh, at Airbus. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your plans in the United Kingdom, how you guys want to grow, and your sort of five eyes vision uh, that you have in, in try to forge a, uh, a sort of a, a, a bigger global strategic partnership? Well, the, the acquisition challenge that we just talked about in adapting to be able to apply these private sector technologies and keep pace with the accelerated and steepening trajectory that they're on so this capability can get to the warfighter more faster and more affordably than ever before. That's a 5 I problem because it's U.S. companies that are leading in this, in this technology developments. So we have doubled uh, our headcount in the U.K. in the last 15 to 16 months. We've added additional geographical locations in terms of our presence in the U.K. because for for the Five I defense organizations to take advantage of this private sector technology, we know we're going to have to have a sovereign presence with respect to network operations, cybersecurity operations centers, with respect to logistics support and repair, so that, or, so that they can take advantage of this technology, but yet they can do it with a sovereign presence that actually has economic benefit locally in the Five I countries. So we're doing that in the UK and on the Five Eyes in order to build that sovereign presence so that as our Viasat 3 capability comes on board, we have the footprint and the skill set and the talent uh, to support it. Uh, and do you, do you feel that there will be any liability uh, as being in a, a sort of a heritage American contractor uh, in a market, for example, where an Airbus has been uh, kind of a leading player over the last uh, couple of decades? Well, we are certainly headquartered in America, but we increasingly see ourselves as a 5i country with a presence across the 5i countries, and we're able to, 
to take the technology and apply it in a 5i context to create sovereign capabilities in the 5i countries to support that. Um, let me ask you a, a last question about uh, space uh, vulnerabilities, much more contested environment. U.S. Space Command is standing up, uh, stood up uh, as, as we speak. There is, uh, you know, the, it, everybody thinks it's just a matter of time before the Space Force itself uh, uh, stands up. As somebody who spent four decades in the space business, how is space changing? How are the changing nature of the threats, uh, whether it's for spoofing or jamming or cyber or even kinetics that are changing how you think about how you deliver capability um, as a senior industry executive? Well, I think we intend to provide a complement and augmentation to the existing military uh, satellite ecosystems that exist. So if you think of this way, the entire DOD, US DOD use case for satellite communications is about 35 to 40 gigabits per second of capacity. And right now, um, and that's all in, X-band, C-band, UHF, KUKA, least owned everything. If you were to apply that use case to our Viasat 3 constellation once it's fielded globally in say 2021 or 2022, that would only be about a little over 1% of our three terabits per second of capacity. So DOD can roam onto these commercial networks and move seamlessly between our network and other networks and do it really affordably because fundamentally you're only paying for that portion of the network you're using. And if you're only using less than 1%, um, obviously that is a significant game changer. You now, it's now satellite capacity is not constrained anymore and roaming among these different assets provides a resiliency. It imposes a cost and complexity on the adversary's calculus because it's one thing to target a military asset, a military satellite or a military ground ecosystem. It's a totally different thing to target a commercial asset, a commercial satellite or ground ecosystem, when you're not even sure that the military is operating on it at any point in time or what portion of it might be. So it changes the game and provides a level of assuredness, security, and connectivity that's never been possible before. And uh, a number of folks, uh, it, it just uh, it sparked me and I feel like I have to ask you this. Uh, lasers, uh, I remember being part of the conversation where DOD was saying, look, if lasers work out, it is going to be game changing, but if they don't work out, it's going to be problematic. Looks like we're on a cusp of a major revolution when it comes to lasers in terms of uh, increasing the stuff that goes back and forth from satellites. What, how are you guys thinking about that? How do you employ it? Uh, what are what are the what are the different? I know you have something to say about this, so that's why I'm asking. Well, Vago, I tell you that um, when it comes to free space optics, let me think of it in a broader context. When it comes to technology disruption and t disruption and technology innovation, Viasat's culture of innovation, the way that we unleash uh, and empower employees uh, to find their passion and then chase their passion and release their creative energy to always find a better way for our warfighter customers, that's going to create enormous advantage of us, so I know I'm not answering your question, but, but stay tuned because it's going to be an exciting time. Fantastic. Ken, uh, Ken Peterman of Viasat, the president of uh, the company's uh, government services business. Sir, always a pleasure. Thanks very, very much. And uh, give the uh, big boss a uh, holler out there too when you get it back out to California. Thank Thanks very much. Always a pleasure. Thank you.